A very good, a very good morning to everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Yep, definitely. Okay. Anyway, uh, a presentation I had put together with another club member here in uh, Sudbury uh, uh, a number of years ago with respect to uh, grounding your station from lightning. And uh, so I put together a, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Uh, it's uh, I'm going to probably say it'll probably go half an hour, so uh, I'll try to restrict myself to that time limit. I don't want to have everybody bored to tears. So there'll be a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, then there'll be an actual uh, series of slides on an actual uh, installation here in Sudbury that would be at the QTH of CV3RX. And then uh, we can uh, handle any types of questions or whatever. I do not propose to be any sort of expert as far as all this grounding stuff goes, but I've picked up a few things over the past decades in the ham radio business. So that uh, if there's any questions throughout the presentation, I'd be uh, happy to address them and at the end of it all. So, uh, oh, and so it's kind of key to think about lightning because we've been through the winter with relatively little lightning or rarely, and now we're into the season of the of uh, warmer weathers and you know how lightning comes around with storms so i kind of always wonder how many people get a little nervous when there's a when you've got your station uh connected and there's a storm coming anyway so with that i'll set up some screen sharing sharing here okay I think we got that one. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, looks good. Uh, if you just want to expand it. Yeah, okay, I'm just going to, uh, still looking good? Yeah, now do you um, want to keep your slides on the side? No, no, I'm going to uh, do the um, the sharing thing here. I'm going to do the the show. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank that's you. That's good, eh? Yeah, that's nice and big. So anyway, so uh, Steve, Steve and I had uh, put this presentation together, and because uh, uh, he was one of the, I was uh, quite impressed with his lightning protection, the way he set it up. So that's, uh, and I offered to take some photos and put together a presentation, and then we worked together on the content. So. First of all, we'll start with some of the uh, the information we kind of should know about lightning, and then continue into sort of uh, how to put in what protective measures to put in, and then I'll have some photos of an actual installation. So, next on the list is points to ponder. Uh, I guess some of this may also be pretty obvious, but uh, nobody knows where lightning is going to strike. And the best thing you can do is try to, if, if you're in the uh, vicinity of a strike, is to redirect it to a grounding system to dissipate the energy outside your home. Uh, disconnecting a coax is, is not sufficient. That lightning can arc across a gap between the end of a coax and any equipment that is grounded to uh, any place uh, in the shack or elsewhere. And the other thing is you don't want an arc inside your home because it's high temperature and anything that's combustible may decide to catch fire. And the other thing is you may not necessarily sustain a direct hit. All you need is an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, which can create an, uh, an incredible uh, uh, burst of energy that will try to find ground somewhere. So just a few of the basic physics facts that have been determined about lightning. I kind of wonder how people decide that they're gonna, <laughs> how they gather this data, how much danger was involved anyway. So you can see that it has a very short duration of two tenths of a second. And then within that, you can have many shorter flashes and they're like measured in microseconds. But the important figure is that 30,000 amps, that's a heck of a lot of power. And the energy will want to take the most conductive path to ground via your tower radios. Yeah, the assumption is there's a tower in this case. 
And uh, interesting to note that the more radials, the better. If you had nine ground radials, 90% of the energy is dissipated. Um, I guess this is sort of theoretical, but uh, gives you a sense. And then the remaining 10%, plus or minus, uh, it's the arresters of the shack, and then more energy is absorbed by a perimeter ground, which is not something many amateurs have. And then, of course, the rest of the energy decides to go into the shack, to your single point ground. We'll come back to that to later. We'll come back to that later. And, this, and ideally, the single point ground should be connected to the perimeter ground. Now, if, if all the equipment is at the same ground potential, even though the voltage may go up, just a second. Okay, got the phone call killed there. Anyway, um, the important thing is that if all the equipment is at, at the common ground, any voltages that go up on down, down on it won't be nearly as big a problem as long as there is no other path to ground from any gear that is connected. So the important thing is to keep it to a single point ground. So now we'll move more to the practical side of things. You must use an external grounding system, um, electrical ground in the house to your electrical service or copper plumbing will not suffice. And I admit that I used the copper plumbing when I first started up, not knowing any better. And uh, copper strapping straps or flashing is better because uh, it has a much lower impedance than a number two wire and a number two wire is pretty big. We already talked about the uh, single point ground. And it's all lines must be protected with lightning arresters. And that includes all of the cables coming in, the coax control lines, phone lines, ethernet cables. And I think at the very bottom, a less than ideal system is better than nothing. And this is a picture of the ultimate grounding scheme. <laughs> And I would say right up front that it, it would involve a lot of work and uh, a bit of cost, but you can see that the tower is grounded. It's uh, got, its anchor points are all connected to a, a ground. And then you can see that when you go to the shack, the shack has a perimeter ground. Now that's a little hard to do if you're in a house because your house is fairly large. So even a partial perimeter ground is good. We'll, you'll see a photograph of that later, but everything's got to be strapped to a common bulkhead going into the shack. And it has to go through a, a single point ground with the arresters and whatnot at the appropriate, at, at the appropriate entry point. So this is ideal. Uh, just uh, explaining the difference between straps, the strap there, you can see the impedance and micro Henry's uh, for the uh, wire, number six wire, number two wire, and then compared to the uh, strap, uh, the strap gives you a lot uh, less uh, impedance. So I don't have a tower, why bother? Well, you you must have, you probably have an antenna outside somewhere and lightning can travel sideways and they're called stringers. There's like these extra paths of lightning that come off the main uh, bolt and strike every 100 to 150 feet vertically, even on the same tower. And your outdoor coax is a conduct conductive path. Lightning cares not how it gets to ground and it will use whatever uh, conductor is available to reduce the path resistance. And wire antennas are excellent conductors for stringers since they are usually long runs of copper. Then it goes to co co a coax to your shack. I don't have an external ground. Use inside antennas only. If you have an external antenna, then there has to be some external ground available, no excuse. And even if you have two or three ground rods tied together, that's better than nothing. 
lightning arresters. Uh, there are a whole bunch of them. I'll have a photo later about them, but uh, uh, quite a few of them also have uh, an element that will be uh, uh, what, that will break open and then you can replace it. An arrestor should be before entrance to the shack tied to the shack perimeter ground. In this case, there's three of the uh, three examples with the one on the lower left being the one that many people may have seen that is not recommended. And so the arrestor should be at the base of the tower with and the tower must have a have its own radial grounding system. And then rotators should all be protected with MOVs, metal oxide barristers, which you install on terminal strips. And coax uh, arresters are rated by voltage and wattage. If you have a regular 100 watt rig, then you should be able to use the lower uh, wattage versions. And then you can uh, get the higher 1K or higher, a one kilowatt or higher elements to put into them. So the same arrestor body can use different elements. And uh, I've talked about the replaceable gas tubes. So this shows, this is uh, on the upper left corner, that's a well-grounded ham radio shack. Uh, everything's in place. And then on the upper right, these strike energy, oh, hold on. Okay, the lower left is where the, the strike comes in and the energy moves outward from the tower base along the radial lines. And then on the upper right, you can see where the charge, that's the shaded area, the charge is dissipating through the radials that are the ground, uh, radio, ground rods and radials together so that they, you can see that uh, most of the energy is still being discharged outside the shack. And then once the ground around the, uh, the shack and all of the uh, radials and ground rods are saturated, at that point, the lightning wants someplace still to go. So at that point, it, it should traverse over to the building perimeter. So that's where I mentioned earlier about a 90%, uh, hoping to absorb 90% before it really uh, gets inside the shack and your equipment. So this is at the point where we're hoping 90% of the charge is, is uh, dissipated. Um, well, perimeter ground uh, must be tied to the electrical panel as directly as possible. Even one side of a shack outside the wall of your shack with a long buried ground strip along the wall is better than simple rods only. Because the wider the, the um, copper flashing is and the more contact it has with the ground, the better the dissipation will be. And when you're doing ground rods, they should be spaced twice apart at twice their depth. So four, rod, four foot rods at eight feet, eight foot rods at 16 feet. And I'll talk more about how to put ground rods in. And the grounding effects dim diminish after about 50 feet from the tower because of the saturation of the ground. And of course, it depends on the nature of the ground, the soil, whether it's sandy or really dry or wet, etc. The more ground rods, the better. Uh, three per leg would be ideal. Uh, is better than one, but one is good. Uh, you can start with that. And you can use common half inch copper pipe as ground rods because you can use a uh, hose with a valve on it and actually uh, sink them with water if the, s the ground of the soil is suitable. If it's really heavy clay, you might have trouble with that. And then the important thing is when you're interconnecting all these bits and pieces, an antioxidant has to be put everywhere. And the copper to copper requires a special copper antioxidant. And then there's, the, there's an ALCU compound, which is for copper to anything else, including steel and gal galvanized steel. Uh, so in general, and this is from the ARRL, in general, doubling the number of radials lowers the impedance by one half. So that's sort of the, the, the math of it all. They don't have to go on a straight line. They can follow the contour of the property, go around obstacles, 
make your turns gradual on it. Don't make any sharp bends because the lightning would like to go straight instead of make the turn. Some will, go down, some will make the turn, but others will want to go through. And the perimeter ground, it's the, if it's only three quarters halfway of the, around the house is better than none. And uh, do your best to get most of the way around. Nick, if I may? Yes. Um, I've got a four foot grounding rod. It's about a foot and a half into the ground. We're on rock. You can't, there's just, there's simply no way to get down unless you get a rock drill. What, any ideas? I'm, I'm open to suggestions. If, if you're on rock, Janice, um, you can only go down a short distance, you said. Uh, then Spread it out. Pardon me? Spread it out. Like, yeah. it doesn't have to go straight down. Like, a lot of times they use those uh, uh, metal, the, the plates, a ground plate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Instead of a single ground rod, then you've got this much area that's in contact with the ground versus that much area. Yeah. So, Absolutely. you, yeah. yeah. So, the idea what is if you're using... I, you know, it would be better to have copper flashing if you have two inch wide copper flashing. If you're, if you're only down a foot, that still um, gives you, like Rusty said, the ex uh, extra uh, area to disperse the charge. The whole idea is to get it away from the house. You may hope, have to take uh, quite a bit of the metal flashing to a point in your yard where you have more soil. But as long as it gives it a path to where you have reasonable amount of grounding, it but anything helps. Yeah. Oh, Vic. As, yeah. The um, if you notice uh, what Steve did, he drilled into the rock several places because the rock does conduct quite a bit of the current away. Anything will help. And I noticed that the Murray Tower Hill, they did that. They had, uh, especially their guy wires were all bonded to the rock and everything was bonded together. So the rock does, does uh, help a little bit for grounding. Yeah. Yeah. If <laughs> the, the, the whole, yeah. Thanks Bill. The, whole, <laughs> the thing is to, uh, to drill into the rock is not something most amateurs would be wanting to do or go to the, the expense of doing it. Uh, Steve's case was a special case where he had a company that came in and drilled and whatnot. But yeah, so even even rock will help disperse. And if there's any moisture associated with uh, the interface between the rock and the soils, that also gives a, a better conductive path. Yeah, when uh, when we used to wire houses and that, and uh, there was rock in that when we used to put the ground outside we used to hammer the 10 foot ground rods on an angle following try to follow the ground the rock on mm -hmm. an angle but the tip of the ground rod try to face it away from the foundation and then we used to put the plates the ground plates you're talking about the big ground plates mm -hmm. uh, in different areas in that and that would uh, be sufficient enough for the hydro yeah yeah so that's yeah the ground plates i didn't mention that but you can actually get uh ground plates too from electrical supply to bury in. Thank you for that information, Dennis. So I'm gonna move along here. Now this is uh, an example of what Steve was involved with. Uh, his shack, I should mention right up front, is a separate building from his home. And well, so Nick, he, yes? Nick, excuse me, you, you kind of skipped over the placement of the tower uh, a lot of folks have their towers placed right up against their houses or some structure, uh, and you don't recommend that at all, according to the previous uh, plate there. Yeah, I, uh, I was, I'll get, that is in, in the presentation a little later, Bob, as far as where to look. If you have a choice on where to put your tower to move it away from the house, that is, I'm coming up to that still. Anyway, so what, this is a copper pipe. Uh, Steve has uh, soil that is, well, not the best, but anyway, he just hooked up a water pipe with a clamp and then turn the water pressure on and then move it up and down and wash out a hole. So he got them down as far as he could. And then he cut off the top and left this much showing. And then he got the copper strapping that you can see going uh, 
around or to the pipe and then he's got it clamped. He's got it going around the pipe and then he's got a clamp at the top and the bottom. And then at the very top of this rod, you can see that he's got one of the uh, uh, clamps that you can use for electrical grounds going to a green ground rod that's going to his electrical panel. And uh, Bill already mentioned that just so happens that Steve is, uh, has a, quite a rock uh, away from his shack. So that's the leg of the tower where the company came in and drilled the holes and sunk in the epoxy and the big bolts. And then they put the adapters to the tower. So this, this is a pretty uh, semi-commercial installation. But the, the thing is that despite the rods going into the rock, he put in copper strapping and jumpers. And you'll notice that the copper strapping goes down the hill from each leg, so there's two of them. Then he actually took the time to make cement and cover the copper because it would not be flapping around in the wind and uh, whatnot. So that's what he did on his tower base. And this is the, uh, the box at the base of his tower where he has the, um, I have a mouse here, don't I? Yeah, I do have a mouse. But anyway, so that you can see that he's got some uh, spark arresters here and, he, and a lot over here. And then on the left-hand side, down at the bottom. Plus he has a, a terminal strip there and you can't see the MOVs, but uh, you can see that uh, there's uh, one of the MOVs is sticking out here. That's one of the, Capacitor, or the thonic capacitor, it's a metal oxide barrister. And then the grounds from the control cables, which go to the rotor here, all go to a common ground here. And uh, then moving along, the, uh, this is about 40, 30 feet away from his tower. And he's got another box on the side of his shack before it goes into the, the shack. And then this is the inside of that box. And once again, we're seeing the whole bunch of uh, uh, lightning arresters in there. And they're all going to those uh, alpha trans trap. I'll show you, I'll give you, a, I'll show you what the, one of them looks like close up. And then this is the other side of the box inside where the terminal strip and all the MOVs are in place. So you can see that there's uh, quite a bit of work involved in this. So. Uh, you, this is, this is going full out as far as this is a full done installation. He, he spent a lot of time and money on it. And then on the shack, on the inside of the shack, he has this brass, brass entrance bulkhead where all those connectors, coax connectors come out. And most of them are, most of them are all type, oh, there's a few, uh, SO 239s for PL220. But anyway, uh, mo most of his stuff is um, type N's. He does a lot of VHF, UHF work. Oh, I guess, uh, so somewhere along the line, Bob mentioned it. I thought I, thought, I, thought I included, oh, here we go. Yeah, uh, short ground rods are better than none at all. And this comment here, when if you have a choice of the new tower, placing at least 25 to 30 feet is a better way than putting it right beside your house, because then it gives more ground around the antenna to dissipate in, any kind of lightning energy coming down the pipe. So, uh, and the other thing is that if your coaxes are longer away from the house, they will also have a higher inductance and limit the surge energy. Now, having said all that, and you've seen that Steve has gone all out and done a pretty good job with uh, his grounding and followed the rules. And so after all that was set up a couple, few years ago, there was a lightning strike very close to his home. And there was an EMP. And he had, of course, uh, disconnected all of his antennas inside the shack. And there was a, the bulkhead is well connected to the perimeter ground and he 
unfortunately did not unplug from the electrical AC line all of his equipment. And then to add to that, his house is about uh, 40 feet away from the, the shack building and everything's underground. So his power, internet, cables, telephone are all buried in a conduit, a large size conduit between the two buildings. So the EMP hit the shack and then induced current and it went down the uh, cabling into the house and it took out his television, took out his satellite television, his oh. uh, PVR. In the shack itself, he lost uh, probably a uh, number of linear power supplies, uh, computers, a uh, computer in the house, uh, some nice HF rigs, an amplifier, and whatever else so he had left it connected to the power so another point is when lightning comes disconnect your equipment from the power holy crap though i mean uh, if if he did all that work and then he got killed what chance do us mere mortals have well that's uh, that was kind of the you know when i talked to steve later i said steve what <laughs> like you just voiced there uh, rusty like okay if that's what happens, what uh, <laughs> what happens if someone who isn't protected, and I think in Steve's case, him having that much protection probably made a big difference. But in his case, he went to his insurance company and they he thought he'd have some grief from them. He didn't go through the rack insurance. He had his home householders, homeowners insurance. And uh, they were really good about it. Uh, he managed to get all the equipment replaced with uh, hardly any issues at all. The only thing he had to do was itemize it all and do all come up with the pricing and whatnot. And uh, when the uh, gesture came through, they brought in a, a guy who was a little technical, but he didn't know much about grounding. And it, it worked out. Steve got his equipment replaced, but it was a lot of bother. So there you go. Just to add to that too, talking with Steve uh, with that and something for a lot of you that may have the newer radios out there right now that have got the land cable that's plugged in directly to the uh, radio itself. That was one of the, uh, uh, Steve had one of the latest radios. He had the um, coax Even. disconnected and everything but he forgot to unplug the land cable and yeah. that's where it zapped and uh, blew his radio so anybody that's got the new icom uh, 7610s uh, 9700s uh, you know those type of radios that you get the land cable plugged right in you've got to remember to make sure they make on search protectors too. for land cables also yes <clears throat> didn't we in, didn't we in the um presentation saying we shouldn't have our coax disconnected and sitting there open but he did do that yeah he had yeah he has the coaxes on the bulkhead disconnected and they're all bunched together just below it but he was uh ideally the brass bulkhead with the large copper strapping going to the perimeter ground would uh, redirect the charge so there was a three or four feet from the cables and of course he wasn't in the shack at the time so we can't really say whether or not there was, was no evidence of any kind of arcing on any of the coaxes that he could determine and he tested all the coaxes after that because you, you can never assume oh the other problem is if you get any kind of a strike you have to test your coaxes all of them disconnect them from the antenna and then test them and you can use something like a rig expert or whatever to determine that the impedance is still right and that they aren't shorted internally or open. Because uh, yeah. I have seen cases where coax got hit and then it blew all the insulation, all the outside insulation off the side of the coax. So, oh, Vic? Yes. Uh, uh, remember to mention uh, how he lost all the tie wraps on his solar array there. So there was a good, a good hit there right uh, at the building, at the shack. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, at the, at the, Steve has a very large solar array on the roof of that shack building, and he has uh, an inverter inside the building, 
and the uh, cables <laughs> that were on, uh, it blew the inverter and, the, and uh, the cables that came in from the solar panel were tie wrapped and it uh, hit hard enough that it flexed the cable and broke the tie wraps wow. off the cable. So it, it, it was a real good lesson in, the, in what lightning can do.